So thanks for the introduction, Toby, and thanks everyone for being here this morning. Um, so as Toby mentioned, my name is Kevin Zyar, and I'm a PhD student at Laurentian and with CROSH. And so today I'm going to be talking to you briefly about um, the focus of my thesis research, which is around stress, anxiety, and depression in the mining industry. So, oops, sorry, my screen is frozen. There we go. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of what I'll be talking about, um, I'll just provide you with a little bit of background information to begin just to set the context. So given that I'll be talking about mental health, I just wanted to cover, you know, what mental health actually is and how that relates to um, how it's affecting people in Canada, in the workplace and in mining specifically. And so from there, I'll be able to introduce to you the mining mental health study. Um, and so essentially, I'll present to you what that study is, how it all began, what we did, at which point I'll be able to conclude with um, a bit of preliminary findings for my thesis research, which as you'll see is sort of just a small chunk of this larger mining mental health study. And so just for a bit of background, um, when we look at mental health, it's important to really define what that is before moving forward. And so mental health by definition is so much more than just not being diagnosed with mental disorder. And so in order to achieve mental health, we need to achieve this overall state of well-being. And so that's uh, realized by a person being able to realize their abilities, being able to cope with the normal stresses of life, being able to work productively, and being able to make a contribution to their community. Oops. Um, now with that in mind, you might wonder how many people are actually affected by mental health problems. And so in Canada, about 20% of people are affected by a mental health problem at any given time. And this ends up costing a lot of money to our economy. Um, and so one of the places where we're really losing money is within workplaces. And the way that happens is primarily through things like absenteeism. Um, so just to put things into perspective a little bit, in any given week, about 500,000 people miss work for a mental health related problem. Um, now in terms of actual disability leads, mental illness is among the leading causes of disability in Canada and worldwide. Um, so in Canada specifically, about 30% of disability claims and 70% of the cost of disability are directly mental health related. Um, and there was actually a study that came out in 2011 that it was across 70 Canadian companies and they found that as much as 78% of short-term disability leaves and 67% of long-term disability leaves were mental health related. So as we can see, a lot of people missing work for mental health related reasons. And if we relate that back to the definition of mental health that I provided at the beginning, we know that in order to have this overall sense of well-being, we need to be able to work productively and feel like we're contributing. So being off work can sort of have this negative um, sort of vicious cycle that continues where it's increasing um, our mental health problems. Now, in addition to absenteeism, there are a number of other consequences of poor mental health on the workplace. And so among those are things like presenteeism, which leads to lost productivity. So essentially presenteeism is when a worker is not well, but they're still presenting themselves to work, um, but unfortunately are not performing to their usual standards and usual abilities. And um, in consequence, we see um, a loss in productivity. Other possible consequences of poor mental health in the workplace include things like higher job turnover rates, sorry, poor worker engagement, as well as job dissatisfaction. And most notably, or most importantly, I would say from a health and safety perspective is the increased risk of a workplace accident or injury. Um, and so we know that workplace injuries can have some pretty serious outcomes. And so it's important to recognize that we need to mitigate mental health problems within the workplace to reduce this risk of accident. Now, if we shift our focus a little bit and we look at occupational health and safety research um, that's specific to mining, typically what you would see in the literature are studies focusing on physical health and safety um, risks and concerns. So many studies looking at things like respiratory health of mining workers, the impacts of various environmental factors such as noise, heat, vibration, et cetera. What we're not seeing a lot of, however, are studies specific to the mental health of mining workers. So we know from the literature overall that looks at mental health in the workplace more broadly or at other very specific occupations that we have all these consequences that I just discussed. The problem is that we haven't actually looked at this specifically as it relates to workers of the mining industry. Now that being said, there are a handful of studies that do exist and what um, they have in common and what they found is particularly interesting because what we're seeing is that it seems that the mental health of mining workers is actually poorer than other workers. 
So when we're comparing um, the mental health of mining workers, they're having things like higher rates of psychological distress when compared to um, sort of broader workforce data sets. One of the problems that we have is that we don't have a complete picture of what's going on. And so we need more research. So there are a handful of studies that are starting to show these trends, but we need to collect more data to be able to really get a better picture of what's going on. Um, in particular, we need to be looking um, at, as I mentioned, studies that are specific to mining, but more importantly, specific to mining in Canada. Um, so out of these handful of studies that do exist, if you were to go look at this literature, what you would find is that the majority of this, this research is coming out of Australia. So we don't have a lot of information with regards to what's going on in the Canadian mining industry. And finally, one of the existing gaps that we have right now within the literature is that we've taken a very general approach at looking at um, mental health of mining industry workers. And so rather than focusing on specific problems such as anxiety, depression, et cetera, we're really taking a broader approach and looking at things like overall well-being or rates of psychological distress. Um, so that is where there's also some room for improvement. Now, that being said, we've also learned quite a few important things from the studies that do exist. And one of those things is that we need to remember that our mental health is impacted by a number of factors. And so when we're looking at the mental health of workers, we need to remember that oh, at the end of the day, a worker is a person. So we can't separate you know, the individual from the worker. It's, it's just one person and we need to look at the whole picture. So with that in mind, when we're looking at worker well-being, we need to consider that there are a number of personal and work-related factors that may be contributing to um, the mental health of these workers. And so from previous research, both mining specific and um, more broadly within um, workplace mental health studies, what we've seen is that some of these factors that are contributing to our mental health are thing like our, things like our lifestyle choices, relationships, um, you know, our ability to balance our home life and our work life. And then, as I was mentioning, some specific work characteristics. So things like the work environment, the demands that we have at work, what kind of shifts or schedules we have, job satisfaction, et cetera. So these are just a few examples, but I just wanted to point them out so that we remember moving forward when we're conducting this type of research that we need to consider all of these factors. And so with all that in mind, um, how does all this relate to the mining mental health study that I briefly introduced at the very beginning? And so a few years ago, um, this was becoming more and more apparent that mental health problems were having an impact on the workplace. So many companies were starting to notice this and people wanted to start making changes to improve the well-being of their workers. And so among these companies, Valet was also noticing this, was also becoming familiar um, with the, the research on this topic in addition to seeing their own um, absenteeism data and noticing that mental health, not surprisingly, or mental illness was among the leading causes of disability at their company. And so with that in mind, um, they really wanted to do something about it to be able to improve the mental health and well-being of their workers. And so from there um, sort of emerged the mining mental health study, which is led by my supervisor, Dr. Michel Lerrière. And it was really from the very beginning, a strong partnership between our research team at CROSH and the team at Valley. And so this was done through the Joint Occupational Health Committee at Valley. So they have representatives from um, the different unions as well as company representatives as well. And so essentially what we wanted to do was to investigate what was going on. So we knew that people were missing work for mental health related reasons. Um, we knew that it was the leading cause of disability, but we don't have a full picture of why that's happening. And in order to be able to make positive changes, to propose changes to improve the well-being of workers, of course, we need to know what's going on and what needs to change. And so that's um, essentially the objective of the study from the beginning was to better understand the mental health and well-being of these workers um, across all of the Ontario operations at Valley. Um, and so primarily in and around the city of Greater Sudbury, and then there's also a refinery down in Port Coburn. And so this is a very large study. It's been ongoing for several years now. So we've collected a tremendous amount of data. And um, as you'll see shortly, my thesis research is sort of looking at a small chunk of this really large data set. Um, and I'll get into the details of that shortly. So just before I get into those specifics, I just wanted to um, give you sort of a quick overview of what we did for the study in order to meet our research objectives. So from the beginning, we decided that the best way for us to collect as much data as possible um, from as many workers as possible was to be was to use a survey and so that's what we decided to do. So we spent several months developing a survey collaboratively so between our research team at CROSH um, along with the representatives at Valet and from the unions. 
And eventually we felt that we had a survey that really was um, allowing us to assess all the different aspects of mental health, as well as a number of those factors that I discussed earlier. And, though, and so we wanted to make sure that it was really ready to roll out. Um, so before we could roll it out to the entire company, we decided to do a pilot study, at which point we were able to test our survey. Um, and so we had a sample of workers um, come into the university, complete the survey and give us feedback. And so from there, we were able to revise our survey and make sure that it was really reflecting the needs of these workers. Um, as part of this pilot study, we also did a number of interviews with workers. And so we were able to get their perspectives on uh, mental health within their workplace as well. So finally, after we completed this pilot study and made the revisions to our survey, we were ready to roll it out to um, the entire workforce. And so from the beginning, the objective was to be able to give all workers an opportunity to participate um, on a voluntary basis, of course. And so we spent about three months on site giving the workers an opportunity to participate, of course, keeping in mind the fact that there are rotating shifts and so being um, going repeatedly to the same work sites to make sure that we were accounting for all these shift rotations so that everyone had an opportunity to participate should they choose so. And finally, the last step, which is an ongoing process, is really to report these results. So there are a number of steps um, between actually collecting the data and being able, being able to share these results, especially that our survey was um, a paper pencil survey. So we had to manually enter everything and um, analyze all the data. And so this is ongoing. So in addition to a report provided back to the Joint Occupational Health Committee, we're also working on different ways to report the results back to the workers. And so as an example, I'll be creating some form of brochure or um, infographic of the key findings from my thesis research once I'm done. And so just a quick snapshot, in the end, we ended up with 2,224 participants across 25 work sites, about half of which are mine sites. And not surprisingly, um, given that the workforce is primarily male workers, only 10.9% of our sample were female workers. And so going back to my thesis research, how does that all fit into this larger project? Well, through this study, we collected a ton of information. So we looked at a number of different mental health problems, a number of different factors that might be contributing, both personal and work-related. Um, but we obviously can't analyze all this data at once. So there's really an opportunity for us to look at different pieces of this data and look at it through different lens. And so for my thesis research, I've chosen to focus on stress, anxiety, and depression for these workers. And so more specifically, my research objectives are to determine how many people are experiencing concerning levels of stress, how many people have symptoms that um, suggest the likelihood of a, an anxiety or depressive disorder, and finally, what are some of the things that are contributing to this? So what are the things um, that are predicting stress, anxiety, and depression for these workers? And so I have a few preliminary findings that I can share with you today, and then I'll just finish off with um, sort of what I am, I'll be doing moving forward. So in terms of stress, um, we found that after um, analyzing our data, we found that overall 23.3% of the workers that we surveyed had levels of stress that we consider to be concerning. And then when we compared um, male to female workers, we saw that women were a lot more likely to report moderate to severe stress levels than male workers. Now, if we look at this from um, an age group perspective, what we're seeing is that there's a pretty significant difference between age groups. So when we're looking at um, stress levels that we consider to be concerning, these are highest in workers who are between the ages of 30 and 49. So sort of that core um, working age group. Whereas the lowest uh, levels of stress are reported in workers who are um, in the older worker category. So definitely more stress going on in sort of that middle category. Now, one of the things that I found particularly interesting and one, thing, one of the things that I really wanted to look at was the impact of underground work on stress levels, as well as anxiety and depression levels. And what we found is that workers who spend more time underground were found to be more stressed. And so we, we sort of divided between workers who spend no time underground, those who spend some time underground, and those who spend more than 60% of their time underground. And the more time spent underground um, resulted in higher stress levels. As for anxiety, when we looked overall, uh, we had 5.9% of participants who had symptoms um, that we considered to be concerning. And once again, we're seeing higher levels of anxiety in our female workers versus our male workers. But this is actually not unusual because typically anxiety disorders occur more frequently um, in women. 
What's interesting and what I wanted to point out here is that unlike stress, we actually didn't see any differences um, in terms of anxiety levels when we compared underground workers versus service workers. And finally, depression. Um, so when we looked at depressive symptoms, we found that 12.5% of workers had symptoms consistent with clinical depression. Once again, um, seeing higher rates in the female workers, which is also not surprising because typically um, women experience depressive disorders more frequently than men. And by age group, similar trends here where we're seeing sort of that middle age category with higher levels of depressive symptoms. Whoops, sorry about that and the lower um, levels in our older workers. And so finally, just to wrap it up, um, essentially those are some of the preliminary findings that I have so far. And so my next steps will include looking at things like shift work. So I wanna compare stress, anxiety, and, level, and depression levels by shift work, as well as that second piece that I mentioned earlier, which is looking at what's predicting stress, anxiety, and depression. And so in order to do this, um, I'll be dividing my um, those potential factors that could be contributing to the stress, anxiety, and depression of these workers into three main categories. So this has been guided by the literature as well as the pilot study. So I'll be looking at various factors such as gender, age, and ethnicity, things like lifestyle um, choices that we discussed earlier, and then some of the work characteristics as well. And so just before I conclude, a few acknowledgments. Of course, my supervisor, um, all of the participants, all the team members, everybody who contributed in some way to the study, CROSS, of course, for their ongoing support, and everyone who contributed financially to my, um, my studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn, uh, for that uh, excellent uh, look into uh, uh, your research and, and how that fits into the Mighty Mental Health Study. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. Um, the first one being, um, so it, just looking, it could be interesting to update the study within the context, like the impact of COVID-19. Is that something that could potentially be looked at in the future or? Um, um, with the database that we have, so the database was collected a few years ago. So personally, my analyses um, are really sort of um, limited to the, that data that we collected. That's not to say that it wouldn't be interesting, of course, to see what was going on and how COVID-19 may have in, impacted the mental health of these workers for sure. Um, and our next question is, uh, again, thank you for like an excellent presentation um, and uh, that they're interesting and novel in a Canadian context, which I absolutely agree with. Um, are you also going to look at your outcomes through a gender-based lens? I think you mentioned that you did it at the end. Yeah, so I, of course, I only have 15 minutes today, so I can't cover all um, of yeah. the results and all the findings. Um, I can easily talk about this for a few hours probably. Um, but yes, definitely going to be looking at um, using a gender-based lens to see how things sort of differ between the male workers and female workers, especially considering that it's very much a male-dominated industry. So looking forward to see how things differ there. Perfect. Um, and another question, it looks like uh, work-life balance may be um, an external contributor based on age and gender. Is that something you would, is that like a fair assessment, you think? Absolutely. So um, again, due to time restraints, I wasn't able to present to you all of the things that we're looking at, but work-life balance is definitely one of those things. So when I talked about some of the factors um, that might be contributing to the mental health of these workers, work-life balance is absolutely one of those things that we're going to be looking at. And it's one of those things that we were able to assess in our um, survey 